Well, folks, it's uh, good to see you for our joint service. And uh, we've come together, haven't we, to worship the Lord. I just have one announcement. Uh, unfortunately, I just have to announce it. Just, it's for folk from Strand. And the reason I have to announce it is next Sunday night, there is no evening service here in Strand because we've been invited up to Knock, Knock Presbyterian. Uh, they have a conference on Monday through to, or sorry, Sunday through to uh, Thursday. And, and the first night is next Sunday night. And so there's no evening service here in Strand, but we're all going up to Knock. If you'd like a lift to go to North Presbyterian, if you normally come at night and, uh, and you normally walk around, if you would like a lift up to Knock, we can give you a lift. If you would say to me after the, the service here, I'll make sure that you can get a lift to church next Sunday night. That's next Sunday night. But it's lovely that we're here together, isn't it? It's lovely that we can meet together like this. And it's the first time we've met together since the new year. So happy new year uh, to our friends from the Church of Ireland and the Methodist. And our first hymn is a glorious hymn. It's glorious things of the are spoken. We'll stand as we worship. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for all that we've been involved in. For some of us, we were at church this morning and all that that meant. We thank you that this afternoon we were able to maybe visit family or friends. We were able to maybe to go out for walks. We were maybe able to just rest and relax at home. But whatever we've been doing, Lord, we thank you that you've been with us and you've blessed us. And we've come here tonight, and the reason we're here is because we want to worship your name. The reason we're here is that we want to meet with you, the true and living God. We thank you that you're here in this place, in all your mighty, in all your power, in all your grace. And Lord, we ask that you might speak to each one of us, that we might know your grace in our lives. 
that we might know what it is to sing these songs of praise to you. And so Lord, be with us in all that we do tonight that will bring honour to you, that we will sing to tell you that we love you. We will pray to, to tell you in words that we adore your name. We will read your word in order to listen for your voice. And as we think about it later on in the service, we invite your Holy Spirit to, to fill each one of us, that you will give us understanding, but also too, Lord, that you will help us become more like you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing again. The first hymn uh, is a, an old-fashioned hymn. It's a lovely hymn. It uh, reminds us of the great things that God has done. The, new, the next hymn is Name of All Majesty. And it focuses on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. We'll stand as we worship. <laughs> going to read from Daniel chapter 6 and we'll think about Daniel chapter 6 for a moment we in, uh, here in the, in the Presbyterian church over the last number of months have been looking at the book of Daniel we, we had a break over December for Christmas and we're at part of the story where um, Daniel as you know uh, was a Jew uh, living in Jerusalem and in around 587 BC the Babylonians came in and took people captive, took the best of the people, uh, the, the young men who were the brightest and the young men who were the fittest, and they took them uh, and brought them to Babylon. And their idea was to make them really good citizens of Babylon, that they would become great assets to, to the Babylonians. And so Daniel and his friends left Jerusalem and were taken to, to Babylon. And when they arrived there, they were expected to eat the food of the king because they were to eat the food of the king. They were to understand the culture of the king. 
and they were expected to worship the religion of the king. And Daniel said, listen, I can't do that. I can't eat this food. And, uh, and so the man in charge of the slaves says, listen, if you don't do this, then I'll get into trouble. And he says, tell you what we'll do is, is for two weeks, I won't eat the food, the king's food. I'll just drink water and eat vegetables. And after two weeks, if I look as if I'm failing, then I'll eat from the king's table. And of course, after two weeks, Daniel and his friends look far healthier than the others who came and ate from the king's table. And so he was allowed to continue not to eat from the king's table. So Daniel then became famous in the land because uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream he couldn't quite understand. And Daniel was able to tell him the dream. And he says, I'm not able to tell you the dream, but God will tell you the dream. And God will be able to tell you the meaning of the dream. And he does that. Uh, and that's amazing. And he's made then uh, someone who's very important in the land. Nebuchadnezzar dies and his son takes over as king. And then while his, uh, the son is away, his son, the, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, is in charge of the land. And while he's in charge of the land, he thinks he's the big man. Uh, and so he has a big feast and uh, he brings all the people of importance and they have a great time at this feast. And then he shows them that he is the man. And he says, see all those things that my father Nebuchadnezzar uh, got from the temple in Jerusalem? I want you to bring them to me. And when they brought the, the cups from the temple from Jerusalem, he takes the cup and he fills them with wine and he toasts the God of Babylon. He says, this is what I think the God of Babylon would like. This is the way the power is. And as he's toasting the, the, sorry, the God of Babylon, there's a hand comes on the wall and the hand writes on the wall. He is terrified. That's why we know he was a big man, but a wee shirt fits him well. Because he was terrified with what he saw. He couldn't understand what was written on the wall. And so he says, well, what will stand on the wall? And of course, nobody can tell him. And eventually Daniel comes in. And Daniel tells him, do you know what it is? God has weighed you in the balance. And you've been found wanting. And that very night, he was killed. And Darius, who is the Persian king, takes over the kingdom. And so that finished chapter 5. And we're now in chapter 6, and this is what we're about to read in chapter 6, is, is Darius, who is the Persian king, is now the ruler. The Persian empire went away from India right across to Egypt. It was the largest empire of the time. And the only empire that was bigger than that, actually, was the Greek empire when, when Alexander the Great came. But that, that's another story for another night. And so here we are, Darius is, is the king. He finds about Daniel and he appreciates who Daniel is and he respects Daniel and he makes Daniel one of the top three men in, in the empire because he recognises uh, the power and the, the prestige of Daniel. And this is where chapter 6 begins. So we read from chapter 6 and verse 1. This is God's word. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators that the satraps, by his exceptional qualities, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were not able to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of this God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, 
O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict, uh, edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays to any god or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels, and he shot the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wind was found in him, because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations and men of every language throughout the land. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Amen. Before we come to look at this, uh, we're going to sing again. Uh, we, our first hymn was about God 
and his trinity. The second hymn we were focusing on, the majesty of Jesus. This third hymn is focusing on the work of Christ uh, and it's in Christ alone. Let's stand uh, as we worship. Mm the story it's a story that we know ever so well but tonight we'll be learning that in spite of appearances God is in control and because of that we can keep our trust in God we live in a world that is full of sin we live in a world with full of difficulties we live in a world that is evil in it and we need to remember that but we also need to remember that God is in control no matter what we see around us no matter what we hear about Syria, or what we hear about Yemen, what we hear about America, or what we hear about anywhere, we need to remember. And even our own situation here in Northern Ireland, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen at uh, the next election. But the one thing we do know is that God is in control. And because God is in control, then we can trust in him. In March, I'm going off on holiday. I'm, I'm going to America. I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to visit my son, and, uh, and so there's a special offering tonight, uh, but, <laughs> but, but uh, it's just in dollars, if you don't mind. And, uh, but we booked the hotel, we, we actually we, we booked the flight, and, uh, and then you have to book this Esther. And it came back, and didn't say no, but it says it was pending. And I thought, oh my goodness, if I had to give permission to go, I'm in trouble. But then it came back 72 hours later, they said, yes, you can go this time. And I don't know what that means. And uh, so anyway, so we've booked the flight and we've booked the hotel and the hotel is round the corner from where Ernest Hemingway used to live. And they've turned his home now 
into a museum. And I just love museums. So I said to Lorraine, we might be going to visit David, but we'll need to go to the Ernest Hemingway Museum. Uh, it's where he used to live. And it'd be great to see it. But Ernest Hemingway, you know, the famous author, you know that. And uh, he was once given a challenge. And the challenge was, can you write a novel using only six words? Can you write a novel using only six words? And he did. And this was a novel. It's a very sad novel, but this was a novel. It's For Sale, Baby Shoes, Unused. For Sale, Baby Shoes, Unused. Now that's clever, isn't it? That's really clever. And so there's a man called John Orberg, who's a Christian writer. And he thought, I wonder if we're able to sum up our life in six words. And so he, he wrote a in a magazine, he asked folk to send them back ideas for six words that would sum up your life. And he got lots and lots of replies. Here's some of them. One person sent this. One tooth, one cavity, life's cruel. I thought, <laughs> I thought that was very good. This wee boy sent, sent one, and uh, he was a nine-year-old boy sent, cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. Someone else said, uh, found true love, married someone else. Found true love, married someone else. So I wonder uh, if uh, we were to sum up different characters in the Bible in six words, what it would be. Here's, here's, here's four. Adam, eyes opened but can't find home. Noah, hated the rain, loved the rainbow. Moses, burning bush, stone tablets, Charlton Heston. And here's the one for Daniel, and this is where. These are, not, these are none of mine, these are John Oldberg's. And this is Daniel, and Daniel is, I won't eat, neither will lions. I thought, now isn't that clever? I won't eat, neither will lions. So tonight we want to have a look at Daniel in the den of lions. And what we're going to learn from this is, despite our circumstances, God is in control. And because of that, we can trust in God. And we're going to look at four things that we can learn uh, from Daniel in, in the story of, of Daniel lying down. The first thing we notice is that the enemies plot against him. Verses 1 to 9. Here's Daniel. Daniel is an exceptional character. It says here that Daniel is, is one of the top three. What, what, what Darius does is Darius wants to run this empire. It's a massive empire from India through to Egypt. And so what he does, he sets up 120 satraps. That's 120 governors uh, to govern this area. And, and the reason he wanted to do this, it wasn't to bring peace uh, to the people. It was to make sure the people paid their taxes. So there were 120 taxmen, if you like. And, and what he did then was, he then divided these 120 satraps into three main blocks. And each block of people had an administrator over, over them. And this administrator was to make sure that they did the job properly, to make sure that all the taxes came in, and the king received all that he should receive. And Daniel was one of these three uh, administrators who were in charge of 40 or so satraps. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because what we read a few weeks ago, but in chapter 5, the last we read of Daniel is Daniel has promised great riches from Belshazzar if he told him what the writing on the wall meant. And that very night, Belshazzar died. Well, actually, he was killed. Uh, God judged him for his arrogance. And it tells us that the Persians come forward and Darius comes. Isn't, interesting, isn't it interesting that Darius makes Daniel one of the top three administrators? And yet he had never met him. Obviously, I mean, months have gone in between chapter 5 and chapter 6. I'm sure that's the case. But here what Darius does, he looks for people who are trustworthy. 
and he looks for people who will actually get the job done. And it tells us here in, in these first nine verses that Daniel had an exceptional spirit. And, and what that means, if, if, if you look at the Hebrew, it really what it's meaning there is that he was someone who was trustworthy, but someone who was joyous in his work. In other words, he took great pleasure in what he did. And so therefore, he was noticed by Darius. And it actually tells us that Darius had plans to make Daniel the top administrator. And of course then, there was jealousy, as there always jealousy over Christmas uh, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you're like me. We get lots of books, and, and I've got a book on the Tudor kings, and in particular uh, King Edward VIII. And, uh, and that's a very interesting period of time to read, because that's the time of the Reformation for, for England. But it was a terrible time to live in England at this time, because there was upheaval between the Conservatives, who wanted to go back and, and, and have the Pope as, as, the, as the ruler, and, and the, the, the revivalists who, who wanted uh, the, the Reformation to come through. And King Edward VIII was always varying between the two, actually. He broke away from the, 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 the papal uh, uh, um, authorities because he wanted to divorce uh, Catherine of Aragon. And, uh, but he, he wasn't quite sure whether he wanted to be a reformist. And it was really very interesting. But one of the things that you read about the court is this. It was really dangerous to be there. Because everybody was vying for the king's ear. And so you had all different groups. And so you could have been the queen. And we know what happened to some of the queens. Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was actually a great revivalist. Anne Boleyn was really for the reforming side. And, uh, but look what happened to her. And... And what, she lost her head, just in case you don't know the story. And, uh, but at that time in the court, it was, it was a, a terrifying time to be. And so you sometimes think, oh, those poor people have no money, uh, they're struggling. But it was actually far more dangerous to be someone very important in, in, in the time of King Henry VIII. Because you could have lost your, lost your head just because of somebody who might have said something against you. And, and at the time of, of Darius... And this great empire, that's what it was like. They were all vying for position. And the one thing that really annoyed them more than anything, and we know that because it mentions at the very beginning, is that Daniel wasn't even one of them. He was a foreigner. In fact, he was worse than a foreigner. He was one of those that were brought from the exile. That's how he's described and yet, as far as Darius is concerned, there was no exile because that all happened uh, with, with um, Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, that is how Daniel is referred to. So Daniel was never accepted and he was always seen as an outsider. And therefore, they were always plotting against him. No one was really for him except for the king, actually. All the other administrators and all the other satraps were against him because of his nationality and because of who he, who he, who he trusted in. And they were looking for ways to get at him. And it tells us that they're, they're looking to see if he's incompetent and he's not incompetent. They're looking for ways in which he's maybe taking a wee bit extra money because that's what everybody does. If everybody does it, you should do it too. That's the idea of it. But they couldn't find anything against Daniel. And they actually said, actually, there's nothing we can find against this man. We're looking for something that we can take to the king to speak against him, and there's nothing. And then someone said, well, actually, the only thing we could use is his faith. The only thing that we could use is his devotion to his God. And so what they did was they looked at his character, and they decided that what they would do is... They would aim for that. And so verses 10 to 18, uh, we see Daniel's persecution. They persecute Daniel because of his faith. It's not because of his work. It's, it's, it's not just because of his nationality. It's because of his faith. And so what they do is they set up a plan 
so that the king may get rid of Daniel. And so what they do is they look at his character and they say, what that man has, he has a true faith in God. He trusts God and he prays to his God three times a day. It was understood at the time of the exile that when, when folk left Jerusalem, although the temple, uh, and when Solomon built the temple, he said, look, this is where God lives, but he's not saying that that's the only place where God lives. But when Solomon builds the temple and he dedicates the temple to God, in his prayer he says that when the people go and leave, that they may face the temple to pray to God. And so therefore it was expected that if you didn't live in Jerusalem, wherever you lived in the world, that you would be praying to God. Now it wasn't expected that you prayed three times a day. There's nothing in the law of Moses that you pray three times a day. But in, in the temple, before the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, there was three main sacrifices in the day. There was a sacrifice in the morning, there was a sacrifice at noon, and there was a sacrifice just before evening. And so, day, or so Daniel then prays three times a day. And he's praying at the time of the sacrifices. So no more sacrifices in Jerusalem because the temple is destroyed. And so he prays to God in the morning. He prays to God at noontime. And he prays in the evening. It's maybe not the only time he prays. But those are the three specific times that he goes home. And he faces Jerusalem. And he prays to God. And the two things he prays about, he prays giving thanks to God and he prays that God will help him to serve him and to use him. That is his pattern. And they use his pattern to persecute him. So they go to the king and they've got this great plan and they say to the king, look king, you're wonderful. Why don't we make a decree that for 30 days no one is allowed to pray to any god or man except to you, O king. And really what that idea is, what they're saying is, here's a vast empire. And one of the problems when you have a vast empire is keeping people loyal. And so really they're coaching it in the sense of, we want people to be loyal to you, king. So why don't we say for 30 days, they're not allowed to pray to other gods. They're not saying they can't pray to any gods at any other time, but for 30 days, what they're saying is, let's tell people that you're the only one that you can pray to because we want to focus people's attention that you are the king of God. That's really what he's saying. <coughs> and so the king thinks about and thinks it's a good idea. The king is not saying that he is the only God. The king is not saying that there are, there are other gods shouldn't be prayed to. But what he's saying is for this limited time, the folk will focus on the king because he is the king of all the empire. And so that's why he agrees. If, it was, if the decree was that no one else would be allowed to pray at any time forever, only to the king, the king would never agree to it. But it was to focus the people's minds that he was the king. And so he was the king of this whole wide empire. And it was a way of bringing the people together. It was a time of national celebration, if you like, focused on the king. And the king agrees to it. No sooner is it announced that they go spying on Daniel. They spy on him because they want to catch him pray. They want to persecute him. And the thing is, Daniel then goes and prays as he always does. Now we could say, what was Daniel doing? Was Daniel not a bit unwise? Because this was only for 30 days. Could Daniel not just do it in secret for 30 days? Would that not have been the sensible thing? Was? Or could Daniel not have prayed in his heart for 30 days? God can hear him in his heart as, as well as audibly. Uh, we know that and Daniel would have known that. Of course he would have. So why does Daniel pray going against the king? What was that about? Well, you see, Daniel didn't see it as being disobedient. Daniel didn't see it as going against the decree. The decree was based, the idea of it was to say that everyone is to be loyal to the king and they have to show that loyalty. And the way you have to show that loyalty is that you have to pray to the king. Daniel's loyalty wasn't under question. Daniel saw that decree in the sense it was for those who were maybe wavering in their loyalty to show their loyalty. 
The king knew Daniel, and Daniel knew the king, and therefore the loyalty that Daniel had for the king wasn't under question. And so Daniel felt that by praying three times a day, he was not being disloyal to the king. He was not going against the decree of the king. This was his habit. He wasn't doing to annoy the king. He wasn't doing to be disobedient to the king. This was his habit. And he recognized that his habit was not interfering with his service. We know that because whenever they looked to see if there was something wrong with the service of Daniel, they found nothing wrong. He was trustworthy. He was joyous in his work. And he was meticulous in his work. And so therefore, his service with, of the, for the king did not diminish by praying three times a day. In fact, it probably was enhanced with him praying three times a day. So that's why Daniel doesn't stop. Because for Daniel, loyalty was not an issue. Showing loyalty to the king was not an issue. He was very loyal to the king. And therefore, praying to the, to the God the true and living God, wasn't an issue for Daniel. It wasn't a sign of disloyalty. It was something that he always did. And of course, they caught him. They thought, this is it. We'll be able to go to the king. And of course, if you notice, when they go to the king, they don't say, oh, here, this is what we found Daniel doing. Well, they go to the king and say, now, king, what was that we said again? Wasn't it that we said that for 30 days, no one's allowed to pray to any other person. <coughs> Pardon me. To pray to any other man or to pray to any other God. Isn't that what we said? And we said that if someone was doing that, that they would be put into the den of lions. That was, that was the form of execution in, in those days. That's what the Medes and the Persians used as, as an educa uh, edu uh, education, execution in those days. And so they said, isn't that what we said? And not only that, when you, when you signed it, did you not sign it and say, that's in the, the law of the Medes and the Persians? And therefore, even though you, king, you making the decree, you cannot change it. In other words, what they're saying is, we pray to you as the only God, but this God, the king, is not all powerful. Because once he signs this decree, he cannot change it. And the king knows that. And so the king says, yes, that's right. And then they go on and say, look, Daniel has prayed to God. And he's prayed to his God three times a day. And it tells us here that the king is devastated. He's not devastated that Daniel has disobeyed him. If you notice that, that's another sign that, that they're twisted the law. And, and not only that, it's another sign that the king... And Daniel were in the same wavelength when it came to the reason why people were to pray just to the king for 30 days. It was a sign of loyalty. It was a public sign of loyalty that they were to do that. And so when the, when, when the king is told that Daniel is praying to his God, the king is devastated. Not that Daniel has been disloyal, but devastated because he knows he can't change it. And Daniel, technically because he's broken that law, will have to be put to the dead of lines. And he spends all day trying to think of how he can get him off, but he can't. And therefore he's devastated when he takes Daniel and he throws him into the den of lions. Devastated because he knows that here is someone who is very, very loyal to him and his loyalty is not in question. And so he throws him full of anguish and he says, you pray to your God that, God that your God will save him. The king never thought for a minute that God would save him. So he goes home and tells us that he's not interested in food, he's not interested in entertainment and he can't even sleep because he knows that he has lost somebody of great value to him. We move on in the story. We have Daniel's protection, verses 19 to 24. And so the king is devastated. And uh, what it is, they have this massive big compound. And it's walled in. And in this compound, uh, they keep lions. And they keep these lions half starved to death. Because the purpose of these lions 
is that they're there to be used as a, 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 an item, a tool for execution. And so therefore, when you throw somebody in, they have to make sure that they're killed. That's the idea of it. So these lions are captive. They're, they're, they're kept in this big den uh, and they're sealed over with, with a stone. And so Daniel is taken in and is closed over. He doesn't sleep all night. He goes the next day and we know, we know the story really well. We know it from, from childhood. When he takes the stone and he, and he shouts sin, Daniel, has your God saved you? There is no hope in that. There's no sense of, of, of a hope that is the case. I know that is the case. There's no sense of that. It's a wee bit like sometimes when, when you're doing a funeral for someone who doesn't know the Lord. People will say things, well, they might be looking down at us or I hope they're happy or hopefully they're at peace. But there's no conviction in, in the words when people say that when they know that someone isn't a Christian. It's, it's a vain hope. Well, the king is like that when, when he calls out and says, Daniel, are you there? He's not expecting for a minute to hear Daniel. But Daniel speaks about his protection. And he says, yes, God sent an angel and he has protected me. He's kept the mouths of the lions closed. And therefore, I'm safe. And there's two reasons why God saves him. He says, the first reason is, I did nothing, in the sight, nothing wrong in the sight of God. And the second reason is, I've done nothing wrong in the sight of the king. This decree was all about loyalty. And Daniel has remained loyal. If you like, he's broken the, the, the letter of the law, but not the meaning of the law. And the king knew that. And Daniel knew that. And the sad traps knew it but they were using a technicality against him. And so Daniel is brought out. Interesting, although this also is in the law of the Medes and Persians. If you accuse someone of a crime and that person is found innocent, then the person who accuses them receives the punishment. And that's why the men who came to him, to the king, and grasped Daniel up for something that Daniel didn't do, then the king then sends them into the den of lions. But you notice there's always consequences with sin. There's always consequences with the things that we do. We think sometimes we can get away with it, but it tells us here, and again, this is in the law of the Medes and Persians, that not only were the people who accused him were sent in, but their wives and children were sent in to the den of lions. And it makes a funny comment here. And the reason I think it's making this comment is it's, it's telling us, it's reminding us that the, it wasn't that Daniel went on a good day. You know, it wasn't that they, they had executed 40 men before Daniel and they'd put these 40 men in and the lions had eaten them. And then when Daniel went in, they were stuffed. And so therefore, they didn't feel very hungry towards Daniel. That wasn't the case at all. And the Bible tells us that. And the reason the way the, the way the Bible tells us that is what happened was when these people were put into the den, they'd hardly touched the ground. They'd hardly got to the bottom of the pit and they were mauled to death. They were eaten alive by the lions. These lions were ravenous. These lions are not the lions that you see on television. Or if you go up to Belfast Zoo, they see these lions sitting about the sun. Although I wouldn't like to go into an enclosure, mind you. But, but they look as if they couldn't do anything. We were talking uh, a few weeks ago here in Strand. And we're talking about Buck Alec. Does anybody remember Buck Alec? Buck Alec used to go to the cinema. Do you remember Buck Alec? Yeah, yeah. Some of the older folk remember. You young folk won't remember. Buck Alec was a man who lived in Belfast. Typical Belfast man. But Buck Alec had a pet, and he used to take the pet, and he used to walk up and down the main street in Belfast, and his pet was a lion. He had a pet lion, and he would walk up and down Belfast. And uh, there was a movie out one time called Born Free. It was all about lions in Africa. And um, I can't remember the cinema. I was told the cinema. It was a cinema, I think it was something on the Lisbon Road. What was it? The Majesty? The Majestic? The Majestic said to Buck Alec, would you come and do us a favour? Would you stand in the foyer of the Majestic where you're lying? And people walk back, going into the cinema, and there was a line beside Buck Alec. And then again, he put his hand in, the and apparently sometimes he put his head in. And, and the story goes 
that the lion had no teeth. But that's, that's another story. I don't know if that was true or not. But these lions were not like the lion that Bokalik had. These were fierce creatures that were not, were not uh, tame whatsoever. And these people suffered the consequences of, of their actions, really. And finally then, very, very quickly, we've got the king's praise. The king recognises that there's something different about Daniel. They recognise that in verse 1. But by verse 25, he also recognised there was something different about Daniel's God. There was lots of gods that were being worshipped. And lots of gods that might have been good gods or bad gods or indifferent gods. Powerful gods and not very powerful gods. There was lots of gods in this empire. Remember the Persian Empire from India away to Egypt? Imagine all the gods that were worshipped in those places. And so Daniel was seen as a good man, a great man. And the god he worshipped wasn't particularly important. But Daniel was. That was verse 1. By the time we got to verse 5, the praise the king has isn't about Daniel. It's not how wonderful my servant Daniel is. Isn't it wonderful that I have him back? He'll be able to work again and I can't wait to see him working No, the praise from verse 25 to 28 is about Daniel's God. How great God is and how he rescues and how he saves and how his kingdom will last forever. And he was able to recognize Daniel's God. And I think as as God's people living in a society that is really difficult, it's nice that people think well of us. It is. But more than anything, As we are faithful to God, we want people not to say, isn't it nice how Daniel is? But we want people to say, isn't it wonderful the God that Daniel worships or Sam worships or whoever worships and that they come to the stage, now we're not sure whether Darius ever got to the stage, where they worshipped the God of Daniel because they recognised the power of God and they recognised the grace of God. And they recognise that this God of Daniel is a God of salvation. And our aim as Christians is that we live in a world that is full of sin, but we live in it confident because despite circumstances, God is in control. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you again for your word. Help us to take it with us and help us to live it in such a way that people notice. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so we're about to have our offering. Just to remind you, what we do with the offerings whenever we have joint services is we keep it and then we use it for something. I think we've just used it recently. Uh, and uh, to help the situation in, in Syria. And so probably the next two or three months as we keep have this offering, we'll be using it to send out to mission uh, of some sort, either home or overseas. So let's continue to worship God. Let's present to God our evening offering.
film and how it speaks about God's grace and how wonderful it is for us to receive God's grace, grace. and can it be that I should gain this stand and worship.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.